thank everyone for joining today and taking the time out to attend our Force for Good webinar. Um, I'm, before I turn it over to Lisa Morris, I am going to just uh, remind everyone, if you have questions, you can uh, type them down in the Q&A section that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. And time permitting, um, we will get to those uh, at the end of the conversation. Uh, so with that, I would like to turn it over to Lisa Morris, who is uh, Forrest Family Office's uh, Force for Good, our, our managing director of our philanthropic uh, arm of our company. So Lisa, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Callie. So hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I think this is a really special panel. Um, we have a very wide and very diverse group of panelists today. We have Simon and Shannon from the Shannon Elizabeth Foundation and their chief happiness officer, Peanut, who is just the most adorable thing. Uh, and we have Shane with the Bart Chilton uh, Fellowship. He is also the CEO of Carbon Fund. And what we want to talk about today is empowering the next generation of youth. I hear a lot of lip service about the topic. I hear a lot of talk about diversity and inclusion and opportunity. But how often do you see actual real world solutions and people that are really making it happen? And our panelists today are doing just that. So I'm not gonna talk too much about myself. Honestly, I'm sick of me and I'm much more interested in them and their work. But a few things I do want you to know, uh, in the chat function, we have dropped a link to donate. We also, to make it very easy for you, have a text to donate feature, which is just text 2100 and type force for good, the number four, not the word. Um, and we'll, we'll repeat that. And please, throughout the discussion, feel free to have any questions you want put into the chat and we will get to them. So our panelists today really come from a very different perspective and a very different background. Simon and Shannon <laughs> have a foundation that really their main focus is conservation. You know, they save big game animals like rhinoceroses in Africa. Uh, they conserve land. And Shannon has decided to start a one woman legacy where she is actually having scholarships for African women to learn conservation. And what I say is there is no conservation without the next generation. So uh, I would like Simon to speak a little bit about their conservation efforts, and then we'll turn the focus to Shannon, the scholarship program, and then over to Shane to tell his story and what he's doing to empower youth here in America. So. Simon, if you would just tell a little bit about your background and work. Um, Simon is actually from South Africa and uh, you know he's very passionate about his land and the animals and I just want you to have a voice. So take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, it's wonderful to, uh, to chat to you all today and chat with you all. And I encourage if there's any, any questions or if you want to know more about anything that we do is please reach out to us. Um, always, always happy to chat. My, my background has been quite an interesting one. I, I had the good fortune of growing up in conservation in Africa. And I, I remember as a kid going into all these amazing parks and uh, just amazing behind the scenes stuff and, and elephant orphanages and running around with, with baby lions and rescued baboons and all kinds of crazy things as a kid. And as I got older, I kind of went into a, into a different space of, of business development and brand development um, work as a strategist and came full circle when Shannon and I, when Shannon and I got together. And when we got together and we, and we started to reform her foundation, we started to look at it in the context of being quite entrepreneurial. And what I mean by that is that I think a lot of NGOs are built out of a single line passion. And because you are passionate about something, there must be a need for it, and there must be a skill set to back it up. And what we said was, was that there was a real opportunity to be far more entrepreneur, entrepreneurial about it, and to really analyze it from the perspective of, you know, is there a gap in the market, but is there a market in the gap? In other words, the work that we wanted to do, was there a real need for it, or do we just love it? Um, and was there a real purpose for it, and could we measure our impact? And that became the mantra. It is pointless doing these things if you cannot have impact. You know, we're talking to 
um, to, to all of you within the, 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 uh, the force group. And you know as, as well as anyone is that any investment must supply a return. So we developed our entire strategic intent around that. Um, and as it's matured, it's, it's changed quite a bit. So we're very much involved in, in public awareness and advocacy and education. And we've got various programs that look after that, um, public education platforms, websites. RhinoReview.org is a big one if you want to know anything about rhinos. Um, then we, we spend a lot of time in DC working as advisors to congressmen and women and senators over the implication of what species specific or environmental policies and decisions taken in the US, how that affects socioeconomics and conservation best practices around the world, specifically in, in Africa. Um, so we try and take a very collaborative view on, on, on a legislative framework as well. Then the land program, which you were talking about earlier, uh, we're looking to acquire land. And uh, with that land, we're able to reinvigorate what we believe is the a need within the biodiversity economy, which says we can't just rely on on uh, philan philanthropy, we can't just rely on state funding, and we can't just rely on tourism um, to fund conservation practices. And what we need to do is to fundamentally change the model and to bring it into this discussion. What, what I mean by that is that if you, if you look at conservation areas around the world, one of the similarities that they almost all share, um, probably without exception, is that these beautiful, exquisite conservancies exist because indigenous people have been taken off that land and those resettled communities along the periphery of those conservation lands are quite often some of the most impoverished um, uh, communities and people on the face of the planet so you've got these wonderful three four thousand dollar a night lodges just at the side of the fence but then you've got this extreme poverty just next to it so there's a huge disparity between our ambition to realize sanctuary for animals when we are completely neglecting those disenfranchised communities. So for us as an organization, one of the things that we are hugely committed to is youth empowerment. And when I was putting this program together, I always use this as, a, as an example. And But um, I, I was putting together the idea of a scholarship fund and what that would mean and what that would look like. And I read an article by the most amazing, amazing young, young lady who's actually become our first recipient of, the, uh, of our scholarship fund, um, Merlin and Como from Zimbabwe. And she wrote an article that literally asked the question, who are we saving Africa if not for young Africans? And it, it, it's, you know, when you read something and you don't read it, you feel it. And that just hit it. And I was like, hold on a second here we've got to fix this. There is a huge, huge disparity between what we're wanting the world to recognize in terms of, of biodiversity and how we are suppressing people in Africa through an access to education, through an access to, to, to careers um, and an access to their own career management. It's not just the skill set, it's so much more, but um, Shannon will get into that now. But so what we realized was, was that if we are going to do this, we have to offer real moments of, of not just empowerment, but mentorship. And what would that look like? So the One Woman's Legacy Fund was developed to break down the, the, the huge number of glass ceilings that young African women come up against, not just within the, within the conservation sciences, but very broadly in society to break through those stigmas, to break through those, those gender issues that are so prevalent across the continent and in many of these conservation areas around the world, whether that's the subcontinent, South America, Central America, et cetera, all of them are, share that sort of gender inequality. And we realized we needed to bring it through. The other reason why I love it and why I'm hugely passionate about this program is that Man is the only animal that has the ability to redirect the course of another animal. No other animal does that. Every single animal on the planet lives in service of something other than itself. You know, an apple tree doesn't eat its own apple. A river doesn't, doesn't drink its own water. Rain doesn't fertilize itself. It always lives in service of something else. And humans are the only animal that have come around and said, I'll take what I can because I can. 
and I'll take as much of it as I can because I can. And there's no reciprocity in that relationship with the natural world. So it doesn't surprise me that come, that come COVID, all of a sudden we presented with this reality where we go, hold on a second, I want to get, all I want to do is get outside. That became the luxury. That became the moment of ambition that united everyone was, hold on a second, we actually need the natural world. We, we need this for our sanity, not just for our own physical health. Um, and if you want to go through the economics, IMF makes the statement that over 50% of the world's, um, of the global GDP is predicated on a healthy and functioning ecosystem. So not just economics, but from, from, an, from a, an emotional perspective, a mental health perspective, we need nature. So suddenly we, be, we, we started to see that the links between the natural world and our disconnection with it and the issues of conservation are inextricably linked. COVID also taught us through the, through the absolute decimation of the tourism industry that conservation itself is not an action, but rather a consequence of an action or actions. And those actions include how do you protect habitat through the upliftment of people? How do you find ways to employ people to look after and care for that land, tourism, conservation sciences, et cetera? When those things happen in harmony, conservation is the consequence. So this idea that, that you know, Shannon often gets it lambasted at her is that, you know, this idea of how can you save animals when they're starving children? The two are linked. We cannot save animals unless we help people. And we cannot help people unless we protect the natural world. So we don't have the luxury of separating these issues anymore. They've gone way too far. So the, the, the scholarship fund is our way of taking a systemic approach to rectifying so many of those historical injustices and also trying to address the urgency of the disconnect we have with the, with the natural world. So helping those, those women break through those glass ceilings and find a way forward is, is extremely important and extremely powerful. Um, and the last thing on nature as well is that in almost all natural societies, elephants, lions, hyenas, wild dogs, dolphins. I mean, I struggle to find an exception. Women lead. Wow. The human society is the only society where men lead. And, and, and we fairly rubbish at it, as we tend to prove over and over again. Um, and we, we've, got to, we've got to take almost like a biomimicry approach to these things and recognize where our shared strengths are. You know, if you take the, the Khoisan, which was the original Chongkwansi, the, the, the original Bushman tribe that have lived in Southern Africa for over 100,000 years, if we look at their culture, they talk about the absolute equality of man and woman. And we just have different roles. You know, we do, just have different roles in terms of foraging or hunting. And they've got another thing that when, when a Bushman will go and hunt and will, and will, will, will successfully hunt an animal, there's, there's something called hunter ridicule that they will tease him, they'll mock the hunter because they'll say that you are not that important. You're doing this for the value of everyone else, but you're not better than anyone else. So the better the hunter is, the more they get ridiculed, which is, it is it's a sign of honor, but it says that we have got to keep things equal. And that's the power of that gender balance that exists in societies that have survived for thousands and thousands of years. And our Western ideas have only been around for hundreds of years and they haven't really shown up. So women are the future, not just for conservation, but for the salvation of the planet completely. And I could not agree with you more. And um, speaking of women of the future and who are the future and, and career women, um, you know, Shannon, one of the things I find so fascinating about you is that, you know, you had a, a thriving Hollywood career, you know, and you, decided to take that, you know, take that experience, take your fame, take your, and, and actually apply it to such important work. And your experience is obviously so different from the experience of women in Africa, but I'd love for you to talk a little bit just about what women in Africa face, you know, what obstacles they're up against and, and why it's important to you, not only to do the incredible work you do saving animals and, and helping to conserve the land, but also training that, that next generation of African women. Um, thanks so much, Lisa. Um, 
You know, when I came out here, one of the things that we did when we got started was look at where our strengths are and what's needed, what is needed in conservation. And throughout working on a lot of our other programs that Simon mentioned, we were, we were at different points where we said, okay, let's, let's find women to help us do X, Y, and Z. And through that process, we started realizing that there aren't a lot of women in conservation. So we started questioning why. And the ones that we do know are powerhouses. They're absolutely amazing. And so we're looking at these women that are making such amazing change, but there aren't enough of them. And why is that? And what's stopping them? And there aren't many local African women in conservation. So we started asking the question. We started talking to people. Simon found Merlin's article that he mentioned. And we realized that there's, there is this glass ceiling where sometimes it's as simple as they, they don't have the funds to buy equipment to get through their schooling. They can't buy a pair of binoculars or a pair of boots to go out into the field and do their schoolwork. Um, also, with a lot of scholarship funds, there's an age restriction. And when, when it comes to women out here, they might have younger siblings that they've had to help raise. And so that's delayed their schooling quite a bit. And so they may only graduate when they're a little bit older. And then they, for so many of these, they don't qualify. A lot of these women um, are first generation graduates and they, they start to find a lot of issues that they've never faced before and it's stopping them from getting further. So one of the things that we've really wanted to put into place with our scholarship fund is not just money for tuition, but it's everything from A to Z. It's all the equipment they could possibly need, but it's also mentorship. Every woman that is sponsoring or people that even aren't able to sponsor, but that are great mentors, they, they are all coming on board to be a part of this program to be there for these women on a WhatsApp group, on a phone call, whatever is needed. Because these, these girls might say, look, I have to give a presentation in a boardroom. I've never done that. I've never used PowerPoint. I've just gotten a computer for the first time. How do I do this? And they need that mentorship. And we also think it's really important to, to try to match these girls with people that have similar life experiences that can really bond them and connect them. It's not always about the work, but maybe they've been through something personal in their life and we find that perfect mentor who's also gone through that and it can help them in so many ways. And we really believe that by taking them from A to Z and everything they could possibly need, their food, their housing, all they have to do is concentrate on their work, their schooling, graduate and go get your dream job. You know, and, and however we can help you, hopefully we've been able to introduce you to all kinds of people in conservation and you already know where you're gonna go and it's already set up where you, you've already done it, you've made your connections, it's a full circle thing. And these women will also graduate Go, go into the field and come back and mentor other girls. And it becomes a full circle thing. And my dream is that, yes, it's starting here in Africa, but I think it'll be the world over. And we decided to call it One Woman's Legacy because one woman can make a huge difference. It's the legacy of the girl going to school, but it's also the legacy of the women who say, I want to mentor a girl. I want to help put this girl through school. I want to be part of her legacy because that's my legacy too. And every woman's legacy is so important. So when we came up with this, that name, we all just got goosebumps and, and we see this being way bigger than our organization. That's really our dream for this. So that women everywhere can be empowered. And one day women will be ruling this world. I hope <laughs> so. so. Yes. Look, I, I, I have goosebumps right now just, just hearing you talk about it. And, and you actually brought up something that I think is important. So, you know, again, I remind our audience to please donate, text to donate, make a contribution. But aside from the money, if somebody wants to get involved as a mentor, um, wh where would they go? What would they do? How would they let you know? What skill sets are you looking for? Because I think a lot of people 
don't have enough money all the time to give to so many different places, but they have a talent, they have a skill, they have time and they, and they want an avenue for that. So where would they go to, for you? Um, to, to answer that quite broadly, what, what we saw as, a, as an organization, you know, just going back to what I was saying earlier about changing the language of, you know, we've done away with donations, but we only talk about investment is that those investments through a structure that we've called our corporate alliance program that we've built up offers a roadmap to be able to identify what each contribution archetype can be and also how do we measure its impact. So that might be monetary, but it might be goods and services. It might be product, it might be time, whatever it is, but it's always equatable as an invest as an investment and quantifiable as an investment. Then we have the responsibility of coming back and saying, what is that return? And in, the, and in, the, and in this context, the, the investment is the education into, into young women like Merlin. Um, that's not the impact. The impact is what she does with her life. And what have we empowered for her to live, not a three or four year school period, but the next, hopefully, 100 years of her life. What, what, have, what impact is that going to have as a result of this? And we need to look that far down the road. And families understand general wealth, generational wealth preservation. We understand patience. We understand looking, looking to the horizon and not looking five steps in front of our feet, trying to get this immediate return. So long story short is that if anybody wants to contribute on any level, um, I ask them to reach out to me personally. Um, my, I'll put my, my email up on this as well. It's just Simon at shannonelizabeth.org. And then what we do is we just go through a consultative process to identify how people can participate, what they want to do, and how we are going to take on the responsibility of reporting back on that investment, whatever that investment may be. Um, so I, I welcome anyone to, to reach out. Um, obviously, financially, we the more money we have, the more girls we can educate. Um, so that's something that is, is always valuable. And do you want to tell them about how much you've come up with um, per year? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, yeah. this is, we, we, we haven't done this, just sort of pulled it out of thin air. What we've done is that we've initiated relationships with the leading uh, universities around, um, around Southern Africa. And we'll obviously scale that up. Uh, but we're chatting to people in Mozambique, we're starting to chat to people up um, East Africa, and universities of massive, massive repute, places like Ornestapuert, the University of Pretoria, the capital of South Africa, has one of the top, if not the top, wildlife um, veterinary school in the world, um, hugely renowned. So we work with them to identify scholars of, of potential and to, to, to work with them um, similarly, with the University of Cape Town, the ornithology department, the Percy Fitzpatrick Institute, is a world leader. Um, and so we're looking at, at collaborating with those organizations to get that done. And when we look at it, if you can imagine this, is that they would be the, those universities that I've just mentioned could be described as African Ivy League, I guess, um, in the relevant study spheres that are going to be pertinent to, to these young women coming out of, um, coming out of university. Uh, and if we had to equate them to the value of an Ivy League education in the States, to school them, so that's all of their tuition, field costs, travel costs, living costs, um, a living stipend, everything that Shannon described earlier, is in the, depending on their courses, in the region of $15,000 a year per, um, per scholar. So we're not talking 60,000 plus dollars that you would experience in the, in the US for the same level of education. It's far more accessible. And that's the beauty of the, the dollar rand, the South African rand, the currency here. The exchange rate is about 15 to one at the moment. So the dollar goes really, really far when we can invest it. So the good fortune of us having the 501c3 in the States, but being able to mirror that with the, uh, with the um, sort of comparable registration marks in South Africa mean that we are able to manage that very, very astutely and, and to be extremely cost effective on that. Um, so that gives you an idea of the money, the people we're working for, and the ways in which people can contribute. And to work out which one works the best for that, 
um, GivTech, which is our proprietary consultative system to unearth the potential of each relationship, um, I'd be happy to walk through that process with, with, with anyone listening here today. And how many years? Um, yeah, how many years? It, it really depends. My, my attitude that we've adopted for the foundation is that we typically aren't getting young women at a school leaver's age. Um, we're focusing more on undergrads and then picking them up from either their second or senior year of their undergraduate degree or from honors, master's, doctorate, et cetera. So there is a, a very unique thing, which Shannon was saying earlier as well, which is, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm talking a bit too much here, but I think this is important, is that when we were looking at the criteria for young women to, um, uh, to apply for the, uh, for the scholarship fund, uh, age was thrown out the window because you're talking about young women that might only graduate high school at 21, 22 years old, because that's the best they can do. Um, it's not got nothing to do with their intelligence. It's just got to do with social circumstances. Um, so trying to trying to pick that up and then also trying to pick up the women of great talent and they're extremely intelligent and they, the ingenuity is there. So we said, I don't just want you to give us an essay of why you want to do this, because we know you can write anything to make us impressed. We want to hear from your professors. We want to hear from your school teachers. They write your application essay, not you. You, you, you deliver something, yes, but we also want to hear about your provable commitment to the task of protecting the natural heritage of the world. Um, and that takes a community to understand and a community to identify. So we work very, very closely with those organizations to try and make sure that we're getting the, the girls of greatest potential. And then we've got a young program as well that we partnered with called Lessons in Conservation, which happens at a, at a school level in rural areas around Africa. And that currently operates in five countries. And we are working with them to identify young women coming out of that that we can migrate into our programs as well. It's, it's really fantastic. And you guys should be really proud of the work that you do um, and, the, and the impact that you're having. And, you know, Simon, without knowing it, you gave me the perfect segue uh, into introducing Shane when you started talking about investment. Because Shane's approach, you know, Shane uh, in his own right, and I will allow him to tell his story in a minute, but, you know, Shane is a very successful investor. But he had to get there on his own and his fellowship and the Bart Chilton Fellowship and what they do is they're offering young people the opportunity to learn on the job, to learn the real life skills, not the Ivy League education, but the actual practical world of how to make it in finance and in a career. So his approach to empowering youth is very different from yours, but it all ties together because the reality is it is all about investment, whether you're working in investment, investing in the future, investing in the conservation of land, in the future of animals. It is all about investment and that's the key word. And so with that, I would love to introduce to everybody, uh, my good friend, Shane, who is incredible. And Shane, why don't you talk a little bit just about yourself. Uh, now, you know, we had Simon from South Africa and, you know, Shannon with the Hollywood career. And now we have Shane from Indiana. So the, you know, heart of, heartland of America is represented here. We're going from Africa to America. And um, Shane, just tell us a little bit about your background, how you made it and why you're so inspired to give back to the young people. Sure. No, so thanks for having me. And I really appreciate the work that uh, Simon and Shannon are doing. And I, and I love this concept of like everything being so interlinked because, you know, we, we kind of have a base premise that uh, a single water, a waterfall can actually start with a single drop. So be that drop, right? Because everything has a ripple effect. Um, I'm first generation American here in the U.S. My parents grew up in British Guyana, South America you know, came to this country with $25 in a suitcase in the 60s to go to school. And, you know, basically always had instilled in me that, you know, you can have anything you want in this life as long as you have your education. So I really took that seriously. I studied hard. Um, I didn't grow up with any access to industry. I uh, didn't have like a network because I didn't have parents that were plugged into society. And so somehow I made my way out to Wall Street, uh, started out in investment banking, and then uh, spent most of my career in venture capital and then went on to uh, you know being involved in a couple startups, and then started my own investment group called Carbon. 
And so I've literally had this luxury of sitting on all sides of the table when it comes to kind of the deal, you know, whether you're selling it, whether you're investing in it, whether you're actually running it. Um, and, you know, what I found out and I kind of look back is that, uh, you know, as I launched Carbon, you know, the whole thesis was to look for businesses that are already proven and profitable and create carbon copies of those all around the world to then have local entrepreneurs start those business alongside us and the original solution provider. So we're working with everything in, you know, decentralized water, distributed energy, sustainable living and education and finding companies that actually already work and then replicating those. And so as, as I was building out the associate base, you know, I have, I have five other partners I do this with, but I was like, you know, I'm, I'm surrounded by all these issues and diversity. You know, I look back on my own life and, and funny now, like I'd be so in vogue if I were a, an analyst or an associate, like everybody would want me. But, you know, I can tell you that wasn't the case, you know, 15, 17 years ago when I was there, I was, I was literally like a brown sheep, as I would say it. Um, I, I didn't have the Ivy League education, even though the school I went to, which was Indiana University, was the number one business school uh, when I graduated and it beat the Ivies and it just didn't matter because it's not part of that quote unquote old boys network. And so I really took this seriously and looked at the lens. I was like, you know, it didn't matter that I, I studied and I was like top of my class. Like that was just the starting point. That's what got me to where I was. But I'll be honest with you, I was still clueless by the time I was 25 years old because I still didn't really understand the ecosystem I was living in because I never had exposure to it. And I was just doing process, process, process. And so now it's like, well, you know what? Maybe I have a real chance to really flip this. And so instead of having associates at Carbon, you know, I basically created a student workforce that becomes the associate base. So I created a year round fellowship program, whether you're in high school, college, or even a grad student, you can work alongside of us and be involved in the portfolio aspect, but also doing the due diligence, the risk assessment, the financial modeling, you know, looking at the market analysis, and then just any little project that we're working on. So it gives you this really just kind of real world uh, working scenario that most people just never have access to. And what was shocking to me, you know, we've had uh, about, I'd say about 50 students go through this program now. Um, and, you know, because this has been underway for a couple of years. And what we found is that, you know, about 20 plus students have now gotten their dream job because of this story. And so what we found is that, you know, by teaching these skills of social entrepreneurship, educating on what the SDGs are, um, helping them realize, you know, what risk assessment really is, how to evaluate a business, a project, you know, these are all things that apply, whether you're going into investing, whether you're starting your own business, whether you're at a company evaluating a project internally, these are all skills that you need to know, but it's stuff you don't really learn until like later in your career. So I brought that to the forefront because that's just the type of analysis we have to do and we give them a shot. But the reality is that we have to spend a lot of time holding hands, right? Like the secret is not anything that, that we're doing is, is, is revolutionary. It's just that we're actually taking the time to be there to help educate and, and be leaned upon when needed. You know, so if I have a student that needs me at nine at night, I pick up the phone and I walk through a financial model, I do it through Zoom, I do whatever it takes because that's how they learn. But at the same time, that's how we progress the ball forward. And so I even, I have a large network of funds I work with and they all call me like, hey, do you have, you know, XYZ type of individual with this type of ethnic background? We're looking through this skill set. I'm like, yeah, I work with them all the time. I mean, if, you know, have your pick of the litter. And so I've had I, just three students off the top of my head. I've had a high school student get into an Ivy League because of this story. If I had, I've had an MBA student um, become the head of an, an angel investing network in Portland, Oregon. That was, she was from Nigeria. So she was a student from the Africa Leadership Group. Um, and then I've had a student who his parent, his, his dad died. And he ended up having to get a scholarship to go to college. He was living basically homeless and bouncing around on couches. And I got him into Wall Street. And this is fundamentally going to change his life. He's like, you know, my goal is to buy a house for my mother back in India because she had to go home to take care of my sick sister. And I'm like, wow, like this really works. And then I had a high school student before he even got to college, already had a private equity internship. He's worked on a crypto exchange. And this kid just blows my mind. He started an impact class at Berkeley on his own. And this has never been done before in the history of that school. And like, this is the talent that we're starting to turn out. And 
you know, not only are they learning all these skills, but they're also learning the basic principles of sustainability. So they know what it means to equally value economic, social, and environmental principles as one. So they take that into workplace. Because what I realized, like, you know, all, the, all these students are going to be rock stars. The reality is, like, I'd love to hold on to them as many as I can, but I can't. But uh, I need them to go out into the workforce because in addition to what we do, similar to like what Simon and Shannon are doing, I believe mentorship and apprenticeship is the number one untapped resource in the United States today to singly uh, challenge the GDP creation and also the diversity issues that we face. It's no one is taking the time. I mean, the cost of education has gone through the roof. Heaven knows how much it's going to cost in, in five years. But you know what? I can actually pick up the phone. I can call people to join our, our calls on Friday, and I have them start to meet with the people they want to network with. So whether they're investment bankers, consultants, entrepreneurs, uh, whether they're in media, whether in finance, marketing, they become our guest speakers. And these students now have a chance to actually have a direct connection to very senior people and organizations. So when it comes time to submit that resume, they don't have to go through that black box. They go to that senior managing director who can single-handedly walk that resume down to HR and say, I know this student and they're a rock star and we want them. And, and it's happened. And so it literally has changed the game and you know, we're placing them into startups, whatever it might be. And it's just become a massive engine for change. And to be honest, it's one of the things I'm most proudest about in my entire life because I actually see it work. And I've seen it work for a dozen plus students. Well, and that's the thing, you, you should be proud of that because these are the things, like I said at the beginning of the conversation, there's a lot of talk uh, from a lot of people about how important it is, but there isn't the right kind of action. And look, education in America is exceedingly expensive. You know, Simon was talking about 15,000 versus 80,000. Kids graduate even if they get into the schools with a massive amount of debt and they still don't necessarily learn what they actually need to know to be good at the job and to be hireable and to get that gig and you're actually showing them, mentoring them, training them. And can I ask you, so I know you have this fellowship program. What is the cost per student? Like if somebody wants to sponsor a student, yep. what, what is the cost for that to happen? So I, I found a really interesting way to magnify this and also grow the experience base. The quick, the quick answer is anywhere from five to 6,000 for let's just say like a summer semester. So we typically have like trimesters. We try to find students who are like either skipping um, maybe a semester at college, uh, you know, during the fall and the spring. And then during the summer is where it's kind of really heavy, right? So it's typically about $2,000 a month. The reason we keep it as low as that and as high as we do it depends on it. Because if you're a high schooler, that's a lot of money. Um, but the reality is, you know, this is, this is given out as a stipend. It's given out as like a scholarship. Because I view this more as like an educational course than like an internship or anything else. Because the amount of hands-on teaching that we do is, is, it's a heavy, heavy lift. And so I want them to have some skin in the game because I did that. I volunteered for the jobs that I could get into. And this volunteering has actually become a big aspect. So we, what we have done, I, I wanted to process more. I got, I got flooded by people. I had like 30 students one summer that I processed through this, right? And I'm like, wow, okay, they're a rock star. Wow, they really want passionate about this. I, I didn't have the heart to necessarily turn them away, but I also want to make sure they were kind of qualified to do it. So what I ended up doing is we actually pay the team leads, let's say it. So we actually give out these scholarships to about five or so individuals. And then we have three to four individuals who are volunteers who don't have like the full-time availability to work underneath those. So they actually get to manage a team they have to hit deadlines, and but they're also doing the group work experience and really digging in. And even the volunteers are like getting great jobs because of this. Like it's the story they get to tell, right? So to answer your question, it's like five to six K, $2,000 a month or so is the way we structure it. And Bart's wife, so the reason why I call it the Bart Chilton Fellowship. So those of you who don't know who Bart is, um, he was one of the CFTC commissioners for the US. You probably used to see him a lot on Bloomberg or CNBC. It was a older white male with this very long white mane, kind of like longer hair. He'd wear his cowboy boots, but he was one of the smartest uh, financial minds out there. But he was also one of the most authentic individuals I had ever met because I had the pleasure of working with him at one of my jobs. And, you know, he'd walk into a room with cowboy boots, but he could, he could hang in any conversation. And he, man, he was just really smart as whip, but he would not give up that side of who he was because he's a huge, huge, huge music lover. 
And so he ended up passing away. He got pancreatic cancer. I was probably, I think I was the last person he had an actual dinner out with. And, uh, you know, that hit me bad because, you know, Bart is actually one of the main reasons Carbis exists uh, because he introduced me to the love of my life uh, one night that I met at an event that he begged me to come to. And that was a big part of the inspiration behind Carbon. So a lot of this started with him, like he was the drop. And so when he passed away, I met his widow for the first time. And I was like, I don't know if you know this, but um, I already started a fellowship in his name, right? So I'm just doing it. That's what a beautiful tribute and a beautiful legacy to somebody who inspired you. And, you know, who knows, maybe one of your students is going to have, you know, the Shane Fellowship, um, you know, it could easily happen. But again, you know, what I like about what you're doing in your investment focus, again, finding things that work and then replicating them. Yep. And I feel like that's what you're doing with your scholarship. You're training people who can then train other people who can replicate it. And there is a failing in our system, now, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I have two wonderful parents, both educators, both public school educators. I think I've got a wonderful education, but I never knew anything. I didn't know what EBITDA was the first time yep. somebody asked me what that was. I didn't understand a lot of the language around finance and financial literacy. It's not taught in school. It's certainly not taught in high school. So when you get your hands on a high school kid, they probably have no knowledge of this. And by the time they leave your program, they have a set of skills that people with master's degrees in English literature do not have. And even I even master's degrees in finance, to be honest, we don't know because they've never built these level of models. They've never done this due diligence. I got to tell you, one of the best students we had this year was a sophomore in high school. He blew my mind away. All the partners came and they're like, like, how old is this guy? And I'm like, he's a sophomore. And I was like, I was like, did you see the analysis? I was like, yeah, I saw it. I was like, it's ridiculous. It's way better than most everything else that came in. And I'm like, I don't know what you do with that. Like this kid's going to be able to write his ticket wherever he wants to go. He just imagine what if he, I, I, and I told his parents, I was like, you give me three more years with this kid. And like, he literally will get to just choose wherever he wants to go. It's like going to be that point and shoot. And I'm like, by the way, like, I'm, and I tell these students, cause they don't fully appreciate it. Right. Especially the ones that go right into private equity or right into venture capital coming out of school. I'm like, how's it feel to be LeBron James? Because you just basically defy the odds of becoming a professional athlete. It is harder to get these jobs than to become a professional athlete. Like that's how exclusive this, this skill set is. And you just did it. And you did it right out of school. It's like, let yeah. that sink in. So many, so many kids might dream of, you know, being an actress like Shannon or a famous musician or, or an athlete and, and some will have the talent and the luck and the combination and the connection to get there. Most won't. But what you're teaching is, is actually the skill set they're going to need to get that prime, prime, you know, private equity type of job that isn't easy to get, particularly when you don't move in the certain circles. And, you know, again, it's like, People say, oh, well, I'd love to hire, you know, I'd love to hire a, a woman of color, but, you know, where do I find them? Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I don't know where they are. I have no idea how to find them. And some of that argument can be legitimate if they're not in the circles they know. So it's like, you know where you can find them? You can find them because they have the experience. They have the internship and the fellowship under their belt. They have the resume credit and they have the skills now. And so I think the work you're doing is really great. So again, everybody out there in our audience, many of you are in finance and you understand what it takes. Uh, and so I think Shane laid out pretty well for you how you can help. Um, again, please donate. You can sponsor one particular fellowship. Um, you know, listen, the costs that we're talking about here today, they're not exorbitant. This kind of money is wasted every day. We, we had an election recount. How many millions of dollars were spent <laughs> With people counting over and over again. So think about yep. it, you know, $15,000 and a young woman in Africa is possibly going to do the work that saves a generation of a right. species. You know, five, six thousand dollars into, into Shane's organization can actually train someone to have a huge future and employ so many other people. So you use the term waterfall and it is a waterfall and it, it is very is. much yeah. These are achievable things. I love to focus on and feature, and this is why I asked you guys to be here today, the people that are doing the work that actually is practical 
and solvable and achievable because the world has so many problems yeah. and it can be <laughs> overwhelming. And, you know, one man can't save uh, rhinos from going extinct, but you know what? One man can, can breed two of them and, and get that next baby rhino and, and one man can inspire a generation of kids. So, so these are the things I, I want our audience to think about that of course we want your money, please give us your money, but beyond your money, we want your passion. We want your commitment and we want everybody to think about what do they know? What can they contribute? What can they offer? Um, so- Can I add one last thing? Absolutely. I would say, look, if, if, if it's not money, it doesn't have to be because look, honestly, we didn't do anything all that special other than deciding to do something about it. And so if you decide to take action, it can be done through time, it can be done through your network and be done through your resources because anyone can be a mentor to these type of students. It's real world experience. These are all network connections. We all know that you don't get somewhere in life unless you kind of have the right path to follow. But if you have the right person to call, it makes all the difference, right? So if it's not time, sorry, if it's not money, there's a lot of other ways to contribute. 100%. So I remind everyone, put any questions you might have uh, in the chat. I'm gonna start trying to read through some of the ones that have come in and some have come to me separately. Um, it looks like we have a question. Oh, Rob, Rob Colorina. Hi, Rob. Um, he asked, what's the geographic use of funds and intended regions raised from? He spent a lot of time in Africa and it's interesting growth content. So I assume that question is for, for Simon and Shannon. Um, where, where are you deploying the funds that you do receive for your foundation? Um, so the, the, the bulk of our fundraising happens in the States um, by virtue of the 501c3 that we have there. Um, and a lot of our operational costs are then experienced in situ. So it, it really depends where that is. Currently, where, where are the funds for the One Woman's yeah, Legacy? So the, 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 the funds for One Woman's Legacy, um, we're focusing on the student, not so much the geography, if that makes sense. We've initiated the program by looking at our back garden, you know, in, in South Africa or Southern Africa, where we've got uh, geographic access to a lot of the universities and the institutions that we're working alongside. So just from a perspective of a proof of concept and from uh, initiating a relationship based approach to this, we trialing it or we're launching it within Southern Africa. So the five universities that we have um, engaged with so far, all South African, but our first, our first student is from Zimbabwe. So we've got no restriction over where in Africa um, these, these women can apply from, but the universities at the moment are fairly restricted. That's simply because that's how we can control it while we scale it up. I think as we go into year two and three and we expand and we're able to uh, we're able to take on more and more young women, um, then that will certainly grow. It is our intention to have no geographic sensitivity to this. And what I mean by that is that, you know, what Shannon was saying earlier is that we truly believe that this program has the ability to outstrip the rest of our organization in terms of its, its long-term impact and in terms of the size that, that it can grow to in terms of the number of people that we are impacting. So we're looking at Africa now, we're chatting to a university in Mozambique, chatting to a university in East Africa as well. So that will naturally expand. And then I think once we've got a sense of maturity in the organizational structure of the fund itself, or the scholarship fund itself, then it is our, our, um, our goal to then take this and to um, you know, to Shane's point of being able to scale things and say, let's just let's just find a scalable model that we can control C, control V, and put it anywhere. And with that intention is to then take it into the subcontinent, into India, Sri Lanka, etc., and then also into South and Central America as well. And we've already had some interest in someone wanting to specifically sponsor a girl in Kenya. So we've talked about very soon going up there and starting those relationships with the universities there so that we could do just that. And that's really all it is for us is having those relationships with the universities. 
um, so we can get them everything they need when they're going there. Mm -hmm. So that's it's on the horizon already. You know, there's so much, and and Shane, listening to you, I, I feel like on many levels we 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 kindred spirits in this discussion because yeah. I th I think that there is such a strong synergy between our, our organizations that I think that there's, there's cause to work together. And what I think that that does as well is that it takes the idea of education global. So we might have a, a focus area initially in Africa, but it's our goal to make sure that these, that these young women are globally relevant in right. terms of their career path, their career management and their career access. So I can't wait for the day that someone like Merlin will end up working at a renewable energies company right. in, in the States because her doctorate is at the intersection of wind power and bird ecology. So how do you mitigate bird strikes of pelagic and coastal bird species on the southern coast of Africa so that you can unlock the potential of wind power? That's what she's doing her doctorate on. So that kind of insight is globally relevant. And I can't wait for the day that I get a call from Merlin going, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna go and lecture in Oxford for a year. Yeah, because that's where I think that these that these women can go. And if we treat it as, you know, there's a there's an African saying, quite ubiquitous, but it takes a village to raise a child. And I think that that's really true when we contextualize the idea of a village as being a global community of influence and how we can raise people with, with, within that community and give them a global community that gives them a global relevance and a global footprint that they can then grow as individuals again and not just be seen as a graduate, but now to be seen as a career professional that has their own ambitions, their own entrepreneurial journey to, to, to walk and what that will mean. And that's when I get really excited by uh, sort of forums like this where you've got someone like yourself, Shane, and someone like yourself, Lisa, that you suddenly can connect these dots. Right. And there's yep. this tiny little program launching in, in the southern tip of Africa, suddenly can influence everything. And that's waterfall to your analogy again, Shane, which is beautiful. It's so true. And we are all so connected. I had no idea when I asked you guys to be on that you'd been in touch with each other separately, not through this forum at all. I mean, how, how it just shows how, how small the global world really is. And, and Shane, um, I assume the majority of your students would all be coming from America, but you know, are, is there no, they're an not. opportunity for, they're, okay. So, so they're global. We have plenty from the Africa Leadership Group. We have people from Europe, South America, Asia, U.S., so that's Amazing. phenomenal. So your kids are not just getting an education in finance. They're actually getting to work with each other and, and having an education in community uh, and global perspective. And oh, absolutely. Global There's global a global big global. international component to this, to international business and just the way projects are evaluated. That's really amazing. Yeah. There's somebody else writing something here. Um, Forgive me as I read a question, but uh, she said, um, I began a youth empowerment group here in Wisconsin during the pandemic. I focus on building the teens up to understand they can change the world through passion. Right now we're building businesses using media platforms, part of a great networking group. Okay, here's the actual question now. Is there any advice that she can share with her teens to keep them moving forward and keeping them inspired? She's saying that the, the families of these students are financially strapped, the, um, the area is struggling, certainly something you guys would relate to in, in Africa. Um, and they've lost so many of their dedicated human services. Um, so everybody's concerned about, about their area and how to have an impact uh, and change their community. Is there, is there advice that you can give um, maybe just as a form of inspiration? I mean, actually, I think Simon, something you said I found very inspiring you know, earlier, which is that, that you know, humans are the only uh, species that sort of doesn't, you know, take care of our own in so many ways in the same way animals do. But I, I want, I would like to hear from, from you guys, what, what advice would you give um, to I would, in an impoverished area? I would, well, I would say coming from a place like Indiana, right? I understand places like Wisconsin, um, but the reality is there's a lot of domain expertise that comes from regions like that, that nowhere else knows. And ag tech is probably one of them. So this whole food supply chain, I think there's a lot of 
great work that's going on just in food and water security, but actually how to sustain us as, as a living being is going on there. And I think there's a lot of opportunities to grow those types of knowledge bases within those communities, but also have a growing skill set of how to enter that space. Because one of the main things hampering a lot of these industries is succession planning. Like you had, there's this massive gap from all these businesses or farmers that have set up, you know, lifelong generational type businesses, but this next gen doesn't want to do it. And so there's this massive gap that's about to hit us that we need to keep these cogs working together. And that only happens if there's knowledge transfer to new talent. Great. That's a great point. Because I always laugh. I mean, I'll use it real quick, like an example. When I go lecture at schools, like everyone wants to be a banker or a lawyer. This I was like, it's like not one of you wants to be a plumber or an electrician. And I can guarantee none of these uh, you know, lawyers and doctors knows how to reset their smart home with that iPad on the wall. But that's a $600 an hour call. And I can tell you the electricians and plumbers and even the chimney sweepers I know are multimillionaires. Look, I can find plenty of bankers. I literally can't find someone to help me you know, with my house. And I, I, I've been looking, nope. so I, I, I definitely agree. Um, unfortunately, we are wrapping up on time. But what I would like to say is that um, our fantastic panelists today, Shannon, Simon, and Shane, thank you guys so much for your time and your perspective and, and your inspiration. And everybody that's here, um, you are. we are going to give their information in the chat. You can also contact Callie uh, at Force Family Office and Callie can connect you directly as well if you have anything specific. But please, dig deep, think about what you can give, financial support, mentorship, connection, ideas. Tell somebody young in your life that these opportunities even exist. Um, and. That's what we're hoping to do here at Force Family Office with our Force for Good series is we wanna be a force for good in the world and we can all do this. So just again, Shannon, Simon, Shane, you're amazing, you're inspiring humans. I think everybody that listened today has to be leaving with a sense of, of real hope about our future. And um, I just wanna thank everyone for, for coming today and, and being here. and. Kelly, um, I know we have to, to wrap up, but um, please yeah. get in touch. Thank you, everyone. And Thanks. everyone in the audience has my email address. Please reach out to me and I can connect you to the right people. So thank you again, everyone, and have a great day. Yeah, Shannon, Simon, get some sleep. You're it's late. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you guys so much. And and just one final thought, we, we all have our jobs, but we also all have our mission on the planet. And I think it's important just to find what your mission is and make sure that you've got your job, but there's always a way to give back and, and have that circle of um, keeping the planet going. So thank you thank guys. You.